speak at the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, uh, not least because Konrad Adenauer was such a visionary statesman of his time and I think should always be an inspiration to all of us in politics who are taking decisions that must stand the test of time and the test of history. Um, but it's a particular honor to be introduced by someone as distinguished as a former president of the Bundestag who's had such a long and important career in German politics, but also a real pleasure to be here with my old friend and good friend, Hermann Groher, who was an outstanding Minister of Health for Germany and whom I worked very closely with when I was Secretary of State for Health in the UK on a number of issues. Um, and it was always uh, not just uh, good for both countries, but also a real pleasure to work with you, Herman. So it's wonderful to see you here today. There are moments in history that remind us that we are all part of something greater than ourselves. As I landed at Tegel Airport this morning, I thought of one such moment. 70 years ago, the people of this city were engaged in a daily struggle to keep West Berlin alive through Stalin's blockade. The skies above Berlin were filled with British and American aircraft laden with fuel, food and medicine, landing or taking off every 45 seconds, day and night. And for 11 months, pilots who had previously dropped bombs on Berlin mounted the greatest humanitarian airlift in history delivering 2.3 million tons of supplies. And at first, Berlin didn't have enough runways to receive the inflow. So the people of Berlin built Tegel Airport with their own hands, taking only 90 days to construct what was then the longest runway <laughs> in Europe. Our countries were just a few years away from a devastating war, and yet we were united united by shared values, and united in opposition to those who sought to destroy them. The people of Berlin overcame their ordeal, transforming this city into what President Kennedy later called a defended island of freedom. Then, 30 years ago this year, Berlin ceased to be an island when the wall came down. As the crowd surged through the Brandenburg Gate in 1989, Berlin and its people reminded us never to take liberty for granted. Those events show that some values transcend individuals, transcend nations or transcend groups of nations, and indeed transcend Brexit as well, however absorbing or challenging that may seem. For whatever treaties or organizations our two countries may join or leave, our friendship is based on something infinitely more important and more durable. Britain and Germany cherish the same freedoms, defend the same values, respect the same fundamental laws, and face the same dangers. We are bound together not simply by institutions, but by the beliefs that inspired the creation of those institutions, democracy, openness, equality before the law, regardless of race, class, gender, or sexuality. Karl Popper, the Austrian-born philosopher, defined the distinctive quality of an open society with these words. We ought to be proud that we do not have one idea, but many ideas, good ones, and bad ones, that we do not have a single belief, not one religion, but many good ones and bad ones. It is not the unity of an idea, but the diversity of our many ideas of which the West may be proud, the pluralism of its ideas. More than anything else, Britain and Germany believe in pluralism as the best way of releasing the nobility of the human spirit. And there's nothing new about this. We shared these ideals in 1972, before Britain joined the European Economic Community, and we will continue to share them in 2019 when we leave the European Union. Because as I said in my response to the wonderful letter written to the Times last month by Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer, 
Professor Lammert, and other distinguished Germans. Britain is not going away. We're not relocating our island to the far side of the world. Our two countries may no longer be bound by the structures of the European Union, but we will remain part of a wider alliance, an alliance of values. Nations united not solely by institutions, but by beliefs in freedom, the rule of law, and human rights. An alliance that doesn't just believe in those ideals, but is willing to defend them, as demonstrated by my predecessor, Ernest Bevan, when he helped to establish NATO. Now, Ernest Bevan was part of the generation of humane and far-sighted leaders, alongside Conrad Adenauer, who built an assembly of rules and institutions, including the United Nations, the World Bank, and what became the World Trade Organization, to create an era defined not by bloodshed, but by peace and prosperity. The goals of the world order that emerged after 1945 were summarized by the former mayor of Berlin and chancellor of Germany, Willy Brandt, who said, I re-emphasize my faith in the universal principles of general international law. They found binding expression in the principles of the United Nations Charter, sovereignty, territorial integrity, nonviolence, the right of self-determination. By any objective measure, that international order built by those statesmen and women has been remarkably successful. Despite the bloodshed in Syria and elsewhere, the number of conflict-related deaths as a proportion of the global population fell by an astonishing 80% between 1984 and 2016. Relative peace has allowed millions to raise themselves from destitution. When I was born, half of humanity lived in absolute poverty. Today, it's less than 10%. Life expectancy has shot up. And since 2000 alone, just this century, 1.1 billion more people have been connected to electricity for the first time. So the rules-based system is not some cynical construct designed solely to protect the interests of the West, and nor will the biggest losers be in the West if this system is allowed to crumble. So when people ask what will Britain's role be in the world after Brexit, I say this, we will put together, put to work, the remarkable array of connections across the globe that history has given the United Kingdom whether through our European friends, our Atlantic allies, or our Commonwealth family, we will seek to bind the democracies of the world together. Only if we are joined together by an invisible chain or thread or shared values will we be strong enough to withstand the challenges we face and strong enough to uphold that international order that has served humanity so well. Right now, it would be an enormous mistake if Europe were to allow Brexit or other internal challenges to make us introspective. Because when we look inwards, our adversaries sense an opportunity. Russia has broken the prohibition on acquiring territory by force by redrawing a European frontier and annexing 10,000 square miles of Ukraine. Having taken Crimea, Russia then deployed troops and tanks in eastern Ukraine, igniting a conflict that's claimed nearly 11,000 lives and driven over 2 million people from their homes. At the same time, the global ban on the use of chemical weapons, dating back almost a century, has been violated time and again in Syria, even also on the soil of my own country in Salisbury. Meanwhile, the onward march of democracy that followed the fall of the Berlin Wall has come to halt, and some say it's going backwards. In the two decades after 1989, there were 29 new democracies around the world. But this century, it's been different. And last week, Freedom House reported that 2018 was the 13th consecutive year when there was a decline in political and civil liberties around the world. So we must never assume that the arc of history will automatically bend 
towards democracy and liberalism. Wise decisions made by a generation of leaders in the last century shaped the world as we know it. And the question is whether this generation of leaders will do the same. And that is why it is so important that Britain and Germany continue to work side by side. There is much to celebrate. Together we are preserving the Iran nuclear agreement, keeping Iran free of nuclear weapons and keeping the world safer as a result. Together we are resisting the evil of chemical weapons from Salisbury to Syria, ensuring the price is always too high for countries that use these terrible weapons. Together we are upholding the Paris Climate Change Treaty, ensuring future generations will not pay the price for our prosperity today. Together we're working for lasting peace in the Western Balkans. Indeed, on my first day as Foreign Secretary, I met, my very first day, I met Chancellor Merkel at a summit to discuss the issue of peace in the Western Balkans. And Professor Lammert, her first words to me as the new Foreign Secretary were, congratulations, if that's the right word. <laughs> um, at the same time, British and German security services and police are cooperating silently and tirelessly to guard our citizens and our European friends from terrorism and organized crime. Our diplomats train side by side. Only last week, 78 British and German diplomats were attending joint classes in the Foreign Office in London. Our soldiers serve together in Afghanistan, where yours are the second biggest contribution to the NATO mission. Our soldiers are also protecting NATO's eastern borders, where UK troops are the largest component of the enhanced forward presence in Poland and the Baltic states. Some in Germany have seen our decision to leave the EU as a retreat, a retreat from the global stage and from common European security interests. Nothing could be further from the truth. Britain remains the only European nation to meet the UN and NATO targets of spending 0.7% of national income on aid, 2% of GDP on defence and 20% of our defence budget on capital. Our Prime Minister Theresa May has restated that Britain's commitment to the defence of Europe is immovable and unconditional. And I'm delighted that Germany has been elected to serve on the Security Council. Later today, Heiko Maas and I will discuss how our missions in New York can best cooperate on areas of common interest, including Libya and Darfur. So at a time when the global balance of wealth and power is changing with remarkable speed, perhaps faster than ever before, we mustn't allow Brexit to be all-consuming. And that means an orderly departure from the EU is of paramount importance. Of course, when you leave a club, you can't enjoy all its benefits, and nor will we. After Brexit, the UK will no longer be part of the councils of the EU, will no longer have a say or vote in European directives or laws. But nor, if we are stand, to stand together against common threats, can Britain ever be just another third country. The future partnership that Britain seeks to build with the EU starts with the belief that European security is indivisible. The political declaration sets out a vision of the closest relationship in foreign policy the EU has ever had with another country, something that Chancellor Merkel herself has emphasized. It states that when and where our interests converge, as they often will, Britain and the EU will combine efforts to the greatest effect, including in times of crisis. We must also maintain the closest economic partnership, cons consistent with the spirit of the British referendum and the integrity of the single market. The flow of trade between Britain and the EU amounts to one of the biggest economic relationships in the world. In 2017, total trade between the UK and the other 27 members of the EU came to 695 billion euros. This is a colossal figure, 8% higher than the EU's trade with China and 12% higher than trade between China and the United States. Millions of jobs on both sides of the channel depend on this flow of commerce. So everyone has an interest 
in ensuring it continues to flourish. Now, there are those who say that strategic and security partnerships can continue unaffected by economic relationships. But we must remember the lesson of history. Trading relationships have always been the first link between countries, and they act as the foundation of all other relations. So none of us should have any doubt that failing to secure a ratified withdrawal agreement between Britain and the EU would be deeply damaging, politically as well as economically. In the vital weeks ahead, standing back and hoping that Brexit solves itself will not be enough. The stakes are just too high. We must all do what we can to ensure that a deal is reached. Last Saturday, Chancellor Merkel delivered a powerful defence of what she called the classic world order. She urged all countries to put themselves in the other's shoes and to see whether you can get win-win solutions together. I would urge our European friends to approach this crucial stage of the Brexit negotiations in that spirit. Because in the future, we don't want historians to puzzle over our actions and to ask themselves how it was that Europe failed to achieve, to achieve an amicable change to its relationship with Britain, a friend and ally in every possible sense, and thereby inflicted grave and avoidable damage to our continent at exactly the moment when the world order was under threat from other directions. Now is the hour for the generous and far-sighted leadership of which Chancellor Merkel spoke. If we are to secure the future of a world order that has allowed both our countries to enjoy the peace and prosperity that eluded our ancestors, if we are to avoid in Chancellor Merkel's phrase, falling apart into the pieces of a puzzle, then achieving a smooth and orderly Brexit is profoundly necessary. Now, it wouldn't be right to end this speech without a quote from Conrad Adenauer, a towering figure in the history of the Federal Republic, and indeed the CDU, in whose honour this foundation is named. The only difficulty is that it means me speaking a little bit of German. Um, <laughs> But uh, this is what he once said. Wenn die anderen glauben, man ist am Ende, so muss man erst nichtig anfangen. When others think we've reached the end, that's when we've got to really begin. The UK's departure from the EU is the end of one stage in our relationship. But it's also the beginning of another. And we are determined to remain the best of friends. So let me finish by returning to that letter written by Annegret Kramp, Karen Bauer, Professor Lammert, and other distinguished Germans to the Times. They were most generous to Britain. So let me say in response, Britain shares the same admiration and warmth for the people of Germany, for your moral courage, for your tolerance, for your magnanimity, and for your towering achievement in building a nation that is at once a model democracy and the economic powerhouse of Europe. When 2.1 million Berliners were blockaded and besieged 70 years ago, they couldn't be sure they would withstand the ordeal and eventually triumph. They survived because of their courage and resilience, supported by the resolute action of friends who shared their ideals and were determined not to abandon the city. Those friends didn't come to Berlin's support because of treaties or formal unions. They acted because of something more powerful, though less tangible. They acted because of the values that united them, just as values unite us today. Those values remain constant, whatever else changes. Let's remember that as we do our duty in the critical few weeks ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we'll just take uh, a few questions from the press and then we'll move into the wider discussion with uh, everyone else. So uh, first of all, Michael Backfish. Um, 
as the clock is ticking and we are approaching um, the Brexit date very fast, how likely uh, is a postponement of the deadline of the 29th of March? And secondly, there are press reports uh, that you wrote a letter to uh, Foreign Minister Maas uh, the 7th of uh, February, um, where you criticize that Germany is blocking arms exports um, uh, to Saudi Arabia by that endangering European uh, defense projects uh, like uh, Tornado and, uh, and Eurofighter. Uh, what is your message in the talk to uh, Foreign Minister Maas today and Economics Minister Altmaier? Well, first of all, um, on the question of the 29th of March, um, this is a very important deadline. It's a, a, a legally binding deadline. Um, I think what's changed in the last four weeks is that we can now see a way that we can get a parliamentary majority uh, for the withdrawal agreement that seemed much more difficult before that. And, and that is essentially to take the deal that we have on the table in its entirety but make a, a simple and important change to the Northern Irish backstop, but one that guarantees uh, the future of the Belf uh, Belfast Good Friday Peace Agreement. And if we can make that change, we are confident that we can get this deal through. And the critical thing is that the British Attorney General, Geoffrey Cox, needs to be able to change his advice to Parliament that currently says that it is possible, if not likely, that uh, Britain could be under the current backstop arrangements trapped in the customs union forever against its will. And that is the issue which parliamentarians have difficulty with. Um, and so this is really the only way through the current situation. And that's why uh, the 29th of March is concentrating everyone's minds. Nobody wants a no-deal outcome. Um, and I think we we now have to uh, do what Europeans do very well, which is come together around a table and find a compromise that allows Geoffrey Cox to change his advice. And then I think we can meet that 29th of March deadline. Um, with respect to uh, the question of um, arms exports to Saudi Arabia, the first thing I want to say is that Britain and Germany uh, have complete agreement on the overriding need to find a solution to the terrible war in Yemen, which is the worst humanitarian crisis in the world today. Uh, over 80,000 children have died of starvation. There's another quarter of a million people starving at the moment, and about 20 million people don't have food security. They don't know whether they're going to be able to get the food they need in the days ahead. So this is a totally critical situation. Um, Britain's Policy with respect to arms exports is one of the strictest in the world. We follow the European guidelines. We have an independent assessment of whether our arms exports are likely to be used in breaches of international humanitarian law. At the moment, we don't make that judgment. Um, but when I talk to Heiko Maas, what I say is that that strategic relationship that the UK has with Saudi Arabia is what allows us to have a huge influence in bringing about peace in Yemen. In fact, I would go as far as to say that without that strategic relationship, uh, it wouldn't have been possible to proceed with the Stockholm Agreement, which is the first ray of hope, although um, others were extremely important in making that happen as well. So um, Britain and Germany have the same objectives, um, but we need to be able to continue that strategic relationship in order to make sure that there is a European voice at the table doing everything we can to press for peace. Um, Daniel Brosler. Yes, uh, Daniel Brosler, Süddeutsche Zeitung. Um, sir, uh, you talked about the backstop. What are you telling those who are saying that Britain has proven to be a very difficult, unpredictable partner throughout these negotiations and that once a solution for the backstop problem would be found, there is no guarantee that new problems might arise? Will there be a guarantee that a majority would be found then for this solution? Uh, and, yeah, actually, that's it. Well, um, I am confident, Theresa May is confident, the British government is confident uh, on the basis of huge numbers of discussions with uh, UK parliamentarians that um, if we solve the issue of the backstop, then we can pass this deal through Parliament. Um, Brexit was going to be a challenging process in any 
event, but it's of course made a lot more challenging because this is one of the unusual times in our history that Britain has a hung parliament, a situation that's much more common in other European countries, uh, but for us is a relative novelty, and that has made the situation a lot more challenging. Um, but we have, throughout the Brexit negotiations, been uh, very consistent in what we believe is the right type of Brexit. Um, and what we have to do is uh, two things. We have to honour the referendum, which, uh, despite Norbert's scepticism about referenda, was a democratic decision, and we have to honour that decision. But we also have to find a way to bring together the country after the referendum, and that means a generous Brexit for the 48% who voted to remain in the European Union. And what will make uh, that happen is if we can show that 48% that we are not delivering the Brexit of their worst nightmares, where Britain pulls up the drawbridge, puts down the shutters, turns itself from Great Britain into Little England. Um, if we have an open, optimistic, international Brexit, uh, then uh, I think they will have confidence that we've ended up with that, that same friendship with Europe, which is as important to the people of the UK as it is uh, to the people of Germany and throughout Europe. Uh, Guy Chazen from the FT. Uh, you, you, that you made an extension to the Brexit deadline to ensure it gets ratified. What would you say um, if the UK asks for three months, but the EU says, we don't believe you have a plan to pass it, and if you want to extend, it has to be for a year, say? Well, we do have a plan to pass it, and this is what we're having uh, very productive discussions about at the moment. I had very good discussions in Brussels yesterday and on Monday, as did uh, Geoffrey Cox and Steve Barclay. Um, you know, there's a lot of ground that needs to be covered, but we do believe that we can demonstrate there is a way through this that can protect the peace process in Northern Ireland, to which the UK's commitment is unconditional. All of us grew up in a period in our history which was terribly scarred by terrorism, and there can be no winding back the clock on that. Um, but also one that uh, we can get through the British Parliament and protects the single market, which we understand is an important priority. So, you know, we are focused on getting that agreement through. We think there is a way through, um, and we're confident if we do that, we can meet that 29th of March deadline. And I think the issue about an extension is whether that really solves anything. I think the last thing that... Uh, people in the UK and indeed the rest of the EU want his Brexit paralysis with this issue hanging over Europe like a shadow. I think people want to move on and they want to demonstrate that we can have a Brexit that respects the referendum result but also means that we remain the best of friends with our neighbours in Europe. Oliver Moody? It's Oliver. Yes. Well, I think it's um, dangerous to uh, put these things in hard percentages. Um, what I would say is that the single most uniting factor in all the discussions that I've had with Europeans, um, with the vast majority of people in the British Parliament, is that no one wants no deal. And that is certainly true for businesses on both sides of the channel, but I think it's true for politicians and people. So uh, I would say that people are working very, very hard to avoid that outcome. But also, in order to avoid no deal, what you have to do is to have a deal. And that means that we need to make the necessary compromises so that the Attorney General can change his advice to the British Parliament and we can um, end up with an agreement that works for both sides. So, um, you know, my view would be that uh, this is really something that there is no enthusiasm for on either side of the channel. And finally, um, Torsten Rico. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, on arms sales, uh, I wonder what's going to happen to all the common uh, defense projects between uh, the UK and uh, its European partners like Germany after a no-deal Brexit. Uh, Britain has already been excluded from the European Defence Fund, which uh, is 
something to worry about. So what, what's your comment on that? Well, I think, um, you know, there are lots of signals that always get sent about the potential for future cooperation and the potential for future cooperation to be harmed in certain scenarios in any negotiation. That's what happens in a negotiation. But I think it is overwhelmingly in the interests of uh, continental European countries to have the closest possible defence relationship with the UK. Uh, and that includes a uh, commercial relationship and our defence industries as much as it includes the practical business of making sure that our countries are safe and secure. So my view is that uh, we will be able to implement what we talk about in the future partnership document, which is the closest possible defence and security relationship, because it's in both sides' interests. Thank you. I think, Felix, we're going to move on to some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Um, the Foreign Secretary generously offered to also host questions from the audience. Um, please identify yourself and keep your question short so that... The past and uh, the leaders of today trying to fix Brexit, but we were not talking about the young generations like me. Uh, I plan to go to London to study there and graduate, but actually uh, I'm in fear because you know, you, you, I don't know, I said back then, uh, you have to create Europe. And I think Brexit is like a destruction. Now we have to fix it. So then we have to create something new. I understand all these kind of um, things we have to focus on. But um, what's, the, what's the idea and for the young generations? And uh, what will make that happen? Thank you. Well, thank you for raising that question. And I think when it comes to younger generations, uh, they are profoundly international in their outlook. And you, know, you are a generation where international travel is much cheaper and much easier than it was when I was your age. And this is something that young people in the UK as well as in Germany celebrate and love. And that's why for them, a, a very important outcome for Brexit not just for young Germans, but also for young Brits, is that we remain an open, outward-looking country uh, that recognises there is huge richness in countries that remain open to uh, different cultures from around the world and can learn from how other countries operate and become friends with other countries. So um, the majority of young people in the UK voted against Brexit. They wanted to remain in the EU because they were worried that might change. Obviously, we're right in the middle of the process now, so I can understand why people still have those worries. We have to prove them wrong. We have to show them that the Brexit that we end up with is a Brexit where the UK and continental Europe remain the best of friends of friendship, like the friendship between Australia and New Zealand, between Germany and Switzerland, between well, I used to say Canada and United States of America, but that relationship's been a bit more tricky recently. But there are lots of examples of great friendships across international borders, and I'm absolutely confident that's where we'll end up, and we have to prove that. Next question, please. Up there. Thank you. Uh, please uh, grab a microphone, if possible. Thank you. My, my name is Ingmar van Doorn. Uh, I'm also a student here, uh, European studies. Um, my question is uh, whether um, there's been some uh, rumor recently about the, the new trade deal with uh, Japan. And um, uh, of course, the UK has sent a letter to uh, Japan. And I was wondering, in hindsight, uh, do you think the letter should have been uh, different? Because apparently there was some rumor about it. And how do you see the, the future of uh, this trade deal uh, between the UK and Japan uh, evolving? Well, we have excellent relations with Japan. I lived there for, for two years and, um, you know, I think it's a, a wonderful country and a great democracy as well. Um, but what we have to do in this Brexit process is to prepare with all our friends around the world for all outcomes. So uh, with a country like Japan, with whom we do an enormous amount of trade, uh, we have to prepare for the possibility that we don't reach a deal. It's not what we want. And so... You know, there are, of course, a lot of exchanges between ministers as to how to do that. And for some reason, um, 
part of one exchange uh, found its way into the pages of the Financial Times, um, which happens to be a Japanese-owned newspaper. Um, and so, um, you know, but I think that the truth is that, uh, you know, we have very good relations. I've been in touch with the Japanese foreign minister, and I don't think there's any misunderstanding between us. And both sides have the priority to make sure that whatever the outcome of the Brexit negotiations, our trade remains uninterrupted. Next question. Yes, please. Yes, thank you very much for your interesting input. I would like to ask a question regarding security and foreign policy. You already talked briefly about, I guess it's working, yeah, okay. You already briefly talked about uh, future defense in, uh, in Europe, and I would like to ask you about um, possible solutions and problems. Okay, I hope it's, you understand me, it's not working very, very well. Um, possible problems and solutions regarding the declining support of the NATO by the United States? Well, we are all, Germany, Britain, the strongest supporters of NATO because it has been the foundation for our security since uh, the Second World War and has probably been the most successful military alliance in history. Um, but we also have to make sure that NATO is fit for purpose for the 21st century. And at the moment, about 40% of the cost of defending Europe and keeping Europe safe is paid for by American taxpayers. Uh, so the US pays about 4% of their GDP for defense, whereas European countries are paying between 1% and 2% of our GDP. And we have to ask ourselves, looking forward, whether that is fair and whether that is sustainable. And that is an incredibly difficult political issue, not just in Germany, but in the UK and everywhere. But that is the fundamental challenge that we need to address if we really believe in NATO, as I think all of us do. So um, America remains rock solid in its commitment to NATO, uh, but we have to recognize that there are long-term issues that, if we don't address, will ultimately uh, be a threat to NATO. And that's why I think we need to take a very strategic approach and remind ourselves of just how fundamental and important NATO has been to all of our security. Thank you very much. Any other question? Please, the gentleman here in the front. Young people, thank you, of young people studying in Great Britain, but there are a lot of difficulties at the moment. That means that uh, all people who want to go uh, to uh, start in spring with the Erasmus program, they don't know what will happen. On the other hand side, uh, if you go to a British university, you pay now the same fees like British people. After the 1st of April, you will pay uh, four times as high fees as uh, the people from third world country. And the third thing is that all the universities, universities in Great Britain, they just work together and their work is subsidized by the funds by the EU and they don't know how they should continue with the money and with their work just together. Well, thank you for raising those issues. Um, let me say what the UK wants. Um, but of course, we're in the process of negotiations and we don't know whether we'll succeed in securing all that we want. We would like student exchanges to continue every bit as much as they do at the moment. We think that actually student exchanges is one of the best ways to build friendship between countries, um, to broaden people's horizons. Uh, and to remind young people who are going to be the leaders of the future that underneath whichever country you're from, we're all the same human beings. And so we strongly support those student exchanges. Uh, British universities are amongst the best in Europe and also amongst the most international in Europe in terms of the number of students they have coming, not just from the EU, but actually from all over the world. Um, and we want that to continue. So we hope that we will have a, a smooth and orderly Brexit that allows us to keep all the best parts of our current relationship. But it takes two people to negotiate. And uh, you know, if the EU decides that these programs can only be accessed by EU countries, well, we would think that's a great pity and a great shame. 
A question up there, the gentleman, please. Thank you, Mark Fisher from G Plus Europe. Once upon a time, actually, with Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Um, Minister, I was very heartened by the tone of um, your speech, um, underlining the common values um, that bind us together, that hopefully will continue to bind us together after Brexit. But values are one leg of the relationship between states. The other one is interests. Um, what I'm a bit afraid of and what we saw in the negotiations also, and nobody can really say that the negotiations on Brexit have gone very well. We all hope that uh, we'll be far further along the road by this point, is by the UK stepping out of um, the European Union, there are a myriad of situations where the interests of the club, the EU, and the interests of the UK will be in opposition. Um, we have to factor that in, and at the same time, what I hope, and uh, um, I would like to get your view on this, think beyond the logic of just the negotiations of 29th of March, and as you underlined, think about our, what binds us in the relationship that will remain important, because as you say, UK is not going anywhere, and will remain um, a, a very important partner. What I'm a bit afraid of, as somebody who has followed international relations for a long time, is the nature of the, of the negotiations as we have seen them um, has, has the potential to poison the relationship a little bit. What do you see in your European counterparts today? You see your German counterpart, but of course you also go to France, Italy, other countries. Do you see an understanding of the importance of, of, of the longer term view? Um, I, I do see that understanding and you know we have uh, very good relations with, uh, with Germany and I um, have personally excellent relations with Heiko Maas, um, but we have to be alive to the dangers you've talked about, because if these negotiations go wrong, then there is a risk that um, we poison relations between both sides in a way that would be profoundly damaging. And so that's why I think we have a, a responsibility to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, when it comes to the difference between an alliance of interests and an alliance of values, I would just say that I think alliances of values are, in the end, stronger. If you do the same thing because you both believe the same thing, then in the end, those alliances are more robust than the kind of transactional relationships where you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. I think the perceived conflict of interest between the EU side and the British side in the Brexit negotiations is mainly around the fear on the EU side that if Brexit is too smooth and orderly, then uh, it might encourage other people to leave the EU and therefore endanger the future of the European project. But I think actually what we've seen over the last two years is a lot of unity by the EU27. And actually, you look at opinion polls inside European countries and actually support for leaving the EU hasn't been growing over that period. So I hope that that confidence that the European project is safe and secure, which is what we want in the UK, because we want our neighbours to be happy and uh, prosperous and successful, uh, not just because they're our friends, but we want to carry on selling them our products as well. Um, so we have an interest in European stability, and I hope that as the EU realises that Brexit isn't going to threaten the future of the European project, uh, that will make it easier to see that actually it's uh, in our mutual interest as well as our mutual values that we have a, a, a smooth, orderly and friendly Brexit. We have time. For Wonderful. Thank you very much for your speech. Um, Leon Zoman, I'm an international affairs student here in Berlin. My question is, yesterday we, um, we heard that Honda is retreating from the UK in production and my question is, um, how will this affect British policy when foreign companies retreat preemptive from Brexit? Thank you. Well, first of all, you know, this is, you know, a very, very sad day for, um, for Britain because uh, three and a half thousand uh, people will lose their jobs. They're going to be affected by this badly. We're thinking about them and their families. Um, and this kind of news is, is never positive. Um, but Honda have been very clear that this isn't primarily about Brexit. This is about um, a change in uh, their global strategy. They're also going to cease production at their plant in Turkey, um, and they are 
concentrating on their production of electric cars, which they want to concentrate in Japan. Um, and I think the real lesson from Honda is the need to adapt quickly for all modern economies to adapt quickly to the huge changes in technology, whether it's driverless cars, uh, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, robotics, the Internet of Things. We all have to adapt really quickly because these changes in technology are going to cause profound changes in our economy. And if we're going to be prosperous in the future, we need to embrace those changes. Um, but in the meantime, we need to do absolutely everything we can for the families that are affected by this very sad decision. And the last question I give to the young colleague from Cast. <laughs> Thank you. Eileen Matlee, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Drawing on um, a previous question and um, against the backdrop of uh, awaiting US interest in NATO, I would like to know um, whether the UK would be able and willing to um, replace the American role as Europe's nuclear guarantor, seeing as the UK um, possesses nuclear weapons as well. Thank you. Well, I think, um, of course, uh, France is also a nuclear power and a fellow member of the um, a federal permanent member of the Security Council. Uh, so, you know, I would never say that, I think there are two major military powers in Europe, which are Britain and France. And I think one of the things that has not been remarked of, remarked on as much as one might expect in all the Brexit discussions, is that the security relationship between Britain and France has never been stronger. And we have huge connections between our two militaries, Uh, we're working together in more areas than we've ever worked together. This was something that was given great impetus by agreements reached between David Cameron when he was Prime Minister and President Hollande of France. And I think that is a, an indication that, you know, behind the noise of Brexit, European powers are thinking very practically about the most important things for the future, which is that countries that share values need to work very closely on defense and security and on all the major international issues. And I'm personally very confident that will continue. Well, Minister, thank you very much, not only for your wonderful speech highlighting the friendship our two countries enjoy, but also for reminding us that uh, airports in this city can actually be built both of which actually give great comfort to me. Um, I also thank the audience for being here and uh, above all, everyone else who has been watching us online through our streaming. Uh platforms which we had and I now hand over the form uh, to Professor Lammert to close our session. Thank you so much. Dear Minister, ladies and gentlemen, I am now responsible for the orderly departure of our meeting, which you have asked for the exit of the Brexit negotiations. And uh, this is indeed a bit easier than the ultimate negotiations on this uh, issue. Ähm, ich bedanke mich sehr äh, bei Ihnen allen, dass Sie hier gekommen sind und insbesondere natürlich bei Ihnen, äh, äh, Herr Minister, für diesen ähm, interessanten und in mancherlei Hinsicht auch nachdenklichen äh, Vormittag. Wir sind natürlich alle dankbar, dass Sie gesagt haben, was wir erwartet haben, dass nämlich, was immer auch nun in den nächsten Wochen passieren wird, wir Freunde bleiben wollen. Aber ich habe mich dann nicht erst heute Morgen, aber heute Morgen eben auch wieder einmal daran erinnert, an die vielen hundert, um nicht zu sagen tausend ähnliche Ansagen, die es von Ehrenpaar, Ehepaaren bei der Ankündigung ihrer Scheidung gegeben hat. Wir trennen uns, aber wir bleiben Freunde. Und in den meisten Fällen war das ernst gemeint. Und hat dann dennoch nicht funktioniert. Nun ist das eine und das andere nicht ganz dasselbe. Aber die Eigendynamik von Trennungsprozessen hat ihre Logik, die man nicht unterschätzen sollte. Und deswegen sind wir uns hoffentlich über die Verantwortung bewusst, die daraus nicht nur bis Ende März dieses Jahres, sondern insbesondere auch für die Zeit danach ergibt. Und mich hat auch ein bisschen nachdenklich gestimmt, was Sie gesagt haben zum Verhältnis von Werten und Interessen und dass in the long run dann die Werte doch 
Und deswegen, wir sollten auch keine Illusionen pflegen, was die Herausforderungen betrifft, vor denen wir stehen. Da wird es bis Ende März und für die Monate und Jahre danach gewaltige Herausforderungen geben, die wir zugegebenermaßen sicher ein bisschen eher besser bewältigen können, wenn wir es in der erklärten Bereitschaft zur möglichst engen Zusammenarbeit tun, wie das auch heute Morgen noch einmal zum Ausdruck gekommen ist. Und wenn wir denn schon, was meine Befürchtung ist, dem Vorrang der Werte vor den Interessen nicht restlos trauen dürfen, dann empfehle ich uns mal, das wechselseitige Bekenntnis, wir bleiben Freunde, im Auge zu behalten, mit einer Träne im Auge, 